OK, very warm welcome to everyone this evening. Thank you so much for coming to join us for this session titled Enhancing Inclusive Approaches in Education. My name is Dr Kristen Darling McQuiston. Uh, I've been a lecturer at the university since uh, 2016 and prior to that I've been a teacher, a primary school teacher um, in different local authorities in Scotland and also in London more latterly. Um, yeah, I will during this presentation make some links to the types of learning we do um, on our master's level program called uh, inclusive practice. Um, and I apologise for that if you're not at all interested in that. Just close your ears, get by, I won't make too much of them. But I thought it might be useful to help to illustrate the types of discussions we have, the types of reflections we have uh, on the program. OK, if you have any questions throughout and um, there's a team supporting us this evening, so you can ask them in the chat box and I'll get round to answer them at the end of this presentation. It should take around 15, 20 minutes and then we'll have time for some questions and answers. OK. OK, so this question here on the slide, how can we enhance our practices, approaches uh, when it comes to being inclusive? And I think the most important thing to say before I try to answer that question is that we probably won't come up with anything, any kind of neatly packaged answer at all. In fact, it probably won't even be a roughly packaged answer. This is a huge question and actually at the end of this evening we might just come up with more questions, but I think that's OK. I'm not going to make any apologies for that. But it does raise one of the questions it raises immediately, I suppose, is that in education, we're always asking these kind of questions to ourselves. The kind of questions based on doing better. How can we do better? How can we improve? How can we enhance what we're already doing? And I, f I do worry. I sometimes feel very much um, exhausting and tiring, especially at this time of year with Christmas holidays around the corner and we just would quite like to put our feet up. But I think it's important to keep our eye on this question and, and we'll come to exactly why in just a moment. Um, but I would like to almost, almost say as well that, you know, after this evening, there won't be any immediate answers, as I've said, not, especially not neatly packaged ones, but it might just some of the questions that we raised tonight might linger with you for a day or maybe two. And if that's the case, then I think we've done an OK job. Um, let's go back to think a bit about, uh, take a step back and think about the concept of inclusion and inclusive education um, before we move on. And this concept, inclusion, inclusive education, schools for all, is relatively new in the context of education and educational practices. It has, however, had a huge global impact and we can think about some of the, the global, global policies and initiatives that have driven our awareness and um, I suppose the, the agenda, the political agenda at all levels to try and make schools, education systems more inclusive places to be, to learn, to work. We've got the, the, I mean, the Salamanca Statement 30 years ago, the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. In Scotland, we have our teaching standards, which inclusion is at, really at the heart of. So um, really, really important and really kind of impressive um, kind of movement of, of this inclusive approach. But while on one hand that is brilliant and amazing, on the other hand, lots and lots of questions exist because well, what do we mean by being inclusive? What is an inclusive school? What, what is inclusion? It is a really, really, really broad term with numerous interpretations. 
And that can make things confusing and difficult, especially when we're sitting in classrooms or educational settings thinking, right, what, what does this mean? And how, how do I make this work for the, for the learners who are in front of me? So I guess there's a, there's a lot to be discussed. And I think that's why we need to keep these kind of questions at the fore. Um, okay. At the moment, I'm not sure how aware you all are, perhaps very aware, perhaps not at all. In Scotland, just recently, there has been um, an independent review of our, suppose, our additional support for learning um, approach. And this was carried out by someone called Angela Morgan, and you've maybe seen some of these headlines, so apologies if this is a bit of repetition for you. Um, but what what she's found and some of these quotations here capture is the feelings of some teachers within our education system here in Scotland. And these might resonate um, if you're not based in Scotland. I would I would love to know where you're all joining me from, um, but they might resonate um, more internationally as well. So you've got here teachers that are saying things like, um, you know, we should only be teaching children who can achieve in exams. And the teachers were very upfront about that. Other teachers saying things like they've become cynical. They once believed in inclusion, but they haven't seen it being delivered in practice. So in many ways they had lost heart. Um, and, and finally, in, in terms of the quotations I've got here, there are many more. The whole concept of inclusion is not fully embraced. There is not a belief that mainstreaming or inclusion of all children is something that should be done. Now, I, I, I surface these quotations not to make any judgments on the, the teachers who said them, not at all, but they help us reflect on um, some of the challenges that exist um, and the, some of the challenges that we have to work with. and. For me, that's often around the systems and the structures that we're working within. And the first quotation there, I think, kind of makes that very explicit. We should only teach children who achieve in exams. Yes, yeah, so that is really surfacing a tension between what the teachers would like to do in the classroom, perhaps, but the systems that they're having to work within. And this quotation made me turn to one of my favourite articles. That's that's how sad I am. I have favourite articles, uh, but ones that oh, I know I can turn to, know will promote, provoke thinking, and I would like to share that with you this evening. And I think we're we're going to um, use some of the insights as a, a kind of tools to help thinking and provoke reflection. And the article is titled An Illusionary Interiority, Interrogating the Discourse, Discourses of Inclusion. I suppose the main questions here is, well, what, what does that mean? Uh, it's very abstract and how can that help us in practice? Um, well, this article written by Linda Graham and Roger Slee is, is fascinating and they do ask really pertinent questions that can help us to land these ideas in practice. And I find this next question on the slide I'm going to show you to be incredibly powerful. You may or may not agree, or you've maybe seen it before. When we talk of including, into what do we seek to include? We contend that to include is not necessarily to be inclusive. I'm just going to leave that there for a second. It's quite, it's quite powerful, isn't it? Well, it certainly is for me. And so I was trying to make sense of this question. And I don't know about you, but when I try and make sense of things, I like to doodle and I like to draw. It helps my meaning making processes. Um, I, unfortunately, as you will just 
as you're just about to see, my drawing skills are not excellent on the computer. So I do apologise profusely about the, the simplicity of this image, not least that it doesn't capture any of the diversity that exists uh, within the circle and out with the circle. Now, the circle itself is supposed to represent the education system. And we have within that education system some learners that seem to sit really nicely. Some learners for whom it's kind of just natural and they almost can ease through the education system. They just fit very well. We have also got learners who are excluded by the system for various different reasons, whether that's particular additional support reads, needs, race, race ethnicity, um, various reasons, multiple reasons. And I think for me, this diagram helps us to kind of start to visualise and recognise the, the systems and structures that we work within make them more visible because sometimes they can feel very invisible uh, and then that's when the blame can land on or the the judgments can fall upon the teachers just like those teachers who were open and honest in Angela Morgan's review and I think we have to look beyond the individual teachers to these systems and structures. So as soon as I created my circle, I, I inevitably got an inside, but of course I also got an outside. And so this physical act of drawing really helped me to illustrate that question that Roger um, Slee and Linda Graham ask, into what do we seek to include? OK, I hope that's clear now from this diagram, I was able to kind of dig a little bit deeper and ask some more questions. So what are the systems, the structures, the values, the practices that create this kind of inside and outside? And I think that's a really helpful question to ask. Is it those external, um, sorry, summative exams that that first teacher in the quotation was talking about? Is it the exam systems that create that um, inside and outside in which some are some learners are more easily to include than others? Summative exams quite often are the baddies in this story. You can tell baddies is my toddler's new word, so that has kind of become part of my language too at the moment. So it's not academic at all, but there we go. That's where we are on a on a Wednesday evening and the run up to Christmas holidays. Anyway, so what are these systems and structures? So is it the exams or is it are there more nuanced, more subtle uh, systems and structures that create this centre, if you like, as as uh, Lee and Graham would say? And they would also ask what we should do to disrupt the construction of the centre from which exclusion derives. Another really powerful question from my perspective at least, how can we disrupt the construction of the centre? And the wording there is very careful and very purposeful because what they're saying is that this, this centre, this idea that there is a centre, um, it has been created. It's, it's a it's a social construct. It's not something that's real, that's been woven into the rules of the universe. It, it is a social construct. And so there are things that we can do to disrupt and challenge that. Um, and I don't mean in a very kind of throw away rebellious way, but carefully and thoughtfully and collectively. And we'll come back to that point again later. So what might this disruptive process look? How how radical could we be if we, you know, blue skies thinking, what could we do? Could we actually just get rid of the whole concept of inclusion and needing to include in by removing um, any kind of very fixed structure system that we work within? And how might that look? 
could we eradicate different categories of learners so there aren't those who are included and those who are excluded and how might that look and, and I meant to say I would absolutely invite you especially if you've got a bit of pen or paper in front of you if you want to doodle some of the images that come into your head and you can do a better job than I can on the computer please do so I'd love to see them um, so we could be fairly radical and think about removing the systems all together or perhaps more in a more kind of achievable sense there might be um, a kind of a middle ground I suppose in which and don't laugh I know this image is is terrible but uh, work with me here um, you know can we push the boundaries challenge the systems in some ways that actually it's not all about including in but us looking out and making more space and creating a more inclusive system in which more diverse learners can most more comfortably uh, learn together and and how might we do that and this is one of my uh, links I'm going to make to one of our courses so if, if you're if you're not interested at all just switch off for one second here um, but we do have a course on the program in which we invite our students to consider the curriculum that they're working with and how an aspect of that they might change, whether that's uh, formal aspects of the curriculum, a particular topic, um, a curricular area, the way it's been taught, or assessment approaches, or, or more informal aspects of the curriculum, like the, the language that's used in this in the classroom, in the school, in the educational setting, and to think about how they might adapt that slightly to create a more inclusive system where there's more space for others. Now, this process of kind of disrupting um, the system in which we, we do become very comfortable. Like I say, that's why it becomes invisible because we become very comfortable in it. And um, the process involves us asking really quite difficult questions um, and it can be uncomfortable. Uh, Foucault talks about the ethic of discomfort and sometimes we have to um, ask ourselves uncomfortable questions in order to bring about some kind of changes or just to help us to reflect more clearly. Now, Roger Slee and Linda Graham believe that actually what we need to do is interrogate our normative assumptions. And I'll read this, the first part of this quotation first so we can get a, a clearer sense of what they mean by that. It can be unsettling to acknowledge that the norm is a fiction. However, normalization is a man-made grid of intelligibility that attributes value to culturally specific performances and in doing so privileges particular ways of being. So we can ask ourselves in our, our different contexts that we're, we're in, that we work in, you know, who, which, which learners are privileged here? Which, for whom does this system work really well and who does it not? And what am I basing, what kind of assumptions am I basing my practice on? Is it that learners learn in a kind of a linear way? Is it that um, the system's essentially built around learners as individuals rather than social groups or a community? And, and this whole idea of dis disrupting the norm is another important theme that that we often explore in our courses. We talk about um, the influence of bell curve thinking and this idea that there is a, a typical learner. You know, there's often that phrase of teaching to the middle and actually the realization that that can be a fictional learner. They don't necessarily exist. So how can we kind of challenge ourselves to think in different ways about our learners in order to become more inclusive. And this is something that we all need to reflect upon all the time because 
everything is always changing. I think I think we're all very aware of that this year. So it, it's an important question to return to for all of us. And, and that can be unsettling and it can be uncomfortable. And I, I don't want to leave you uh, on that kind of cliff edge. So that's why I included the second part of the quotation on the slide. Um, because I think it gives us a way of thinking, um, a basis on which to which to build and develop our practices. OK, although predicated as natural and true, the rule of the norm is statistically derived, negating the diversity to be found within nature and the naturalness of diversity. And this is maybe something that's so entirely obvious, but again is so easily forgotten. Learner diversity is absolutely the norm. It should be expected. We should never expect, uh, you know, different groups of learners to perform in the same way, to be at the same stage at the same point of the year. Yet we can, we, we can sort of, and we become a bit unnerved when we we have a group of learners who don't do things the way that we're used to the previous classes doing, for example. I do the same. I did the same this year. I had a group of students and because of COVID and the disruption it caused, I wanted to make sure I looked back at all the kind of the grade averages for the last few years to see that they were around the same as usual. And then I thought, why am I doing that? They're an absolutely different group of students. Um, so so it, it can be so easy for, to forget. But student diversity, learner diversity is absolutely natural and normal. And I think that gives us a really helpful way forward in terms of thinking about how inclusive our approaches are and how we can perhaps make them even more inclusive and it's something that um, is, is talking about really quite broadly and widely within the world of inclusion. Um, Lani Florian who's prolific in this area and Jenny Spratt who, who, who uh, allowed me to take over as the Programme Director for Inclusive Practice their work on, and others, many others, Christine Black Hawkins, Martin Rouse, um, their work has all been based on sort of foundational assumptions, principles, um, and in their development of what they call inclusive pedagogy, which is a kind of a very specific framework for thinking about how we might be inclusive in practice. The first main principle they always are very upfront about is that human diversity is a starting point, but they take that a bit further. And they say that it's not just something that exists in there that we should expect, but it's a strength rather than a problem. As children work together, sharing ideas, learning from their interactions with each other. So, Again, I think that's really helpful and it can help us to create the little, maybe can we call them ripples of disruptions, tiny little mini disruptions that we can take place in our in our places of work uh, with our learners at whatever stage they're at. In what ways can we create opportunities for diverse learners to come together, to learn together, to interact with each other? Uh, and it might be something that you're absolutely already doing and in that case you can just feel great about that and feel like yes this is being inclusive and now I've got a quotation to go with it and I can put that in my file and share that with colleagues and that's fine um, but if it's something that's forgotten and it can be and that's with no judgment at all our system is very much geared towards a notion of a, a typical learner who will progress through the standards, the stages in, in a very linear way. And, and as we all know, that is just not the case. So how can we create opportunities for diverse learners to come together? I am nearly at the, the end, I'm moving towards it. And, and again, 
as individuals kind of logging in from our PCs, wherever we are, it can feel like, oh, how do I do this all alone? <laughs> and you don't. You absolutely don't do um, this alone. If we if we think about our initial question of how do I enhance um, inclusive um, practices, inclusive approaches, well, this if we wanted an answer, it might be with the help of others. Um, and we need to remember that too. And I think, uh, I think again, the events this year have hopefully made us realise that we need to pull together, we need to work together. And I've drawn here from the work of Judith Sachs. Um, and she actually helps to nudge us further, further than just enhancing practice. She actually talks about how we might be a bit more than that, how we might be a bit more transformative. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe she's right. Maybe we need to do more than just improve what we're always doing. Maybe we need to try and create ripples of change um, based on principles of inclusion, social justice, etc. But what she says is, she says transformative teachers also collaborate at a deep level with colleagues, students and other stakeholders and necessary for such collaboration is a willingness to be open to change and transformation in themselves. Given that this is political work and, and it, we can't ignore that, it requires building collaborative partnerships between various stakeholders whose task is to work together combining their expertise, uh, experiences and resources. Education reform networks are a type of collaborative action to support teachers. For Lieberman, these networks are flexible, borderless and innovative, able to create collaborative environments and focus on deep agendas that grow and change with participants. And I suppose in a way, in my um, kind of not so subtle way. This is a bit of an open invitation of, um, you know, we are here in the university and it can sometimes feel like we're working alone and there are so many educators in other contexts who can feel unsupported and alone. And actually what we could be doing more is building these networks, these flexible borderless networks and perhaps our needing to embrace online working might help us with that um, but we we I would love to hear from you uh, work with you welcome you onto the program uh, but if that isn't a, an option for whatever reason but certainly to to explore possibilities and what we might do to answer that question of how do we enhance practice or how do we transform our practice in order to make it more inclusive. And I don't know, have any idea how I'm doing for time, um, probably way longer than I was supposed to talk. Uh, here are some references here, and I'd like to invite you, if you've got any questions, um, to, to share them with us. Or otherwise you might be ready for dinner. Thank you, Kirsten. Yes, we do have a couple of questions here for you. Um, so the first one is, I'm curious to hear about how these questions that are being raised apply when the barrier to inclusion is one of access to technology, something which is likely to become more and more of a concern going forward. We cannot personally guarantee access to technology, so how can we ensure equitable treatment in a digital setting? What a fantastic question. Um, and can I cop out by by answering and saying that I think that is why we need um, to develop collaborative networks, that I think we need to think beyond um, just sort of just an educators coming together. Uh, I think this this pandemic has shown to us that actually we need to be pooling from resources, people, expertise, experiences, you know, much more broadly than, than just education in order, like you say, a very important point that to in, ensure access for our learners. I mean, and it's it's not even just having 
the technology it's having a space in your house where it's quiet and you can concentrate and you can engage in the learning not everyone is privileged to having that and um, so so how we, I think we one we've got to be creative and two we've really got to work together and I know that's probably um, like I say a bit of a cop out in terms of an answer but I think that is probably the the way we have to go I'm not sure if that's helpful Thank you. Um, the next question is, I get the theory that we should be inclusive. However, when it is disrupting my child's learning because the teacher is so focused on helping the minority rather than the majority, how is that fair? Schools are judged whether we like it or not by exam results. Yeah, oh, good, really good question and really fair question. Um, and I think you raise. I think there's kind of two important points there. Um, maybe the the exam results just it's almost creates a certain amount of pressure within the system. And actually, we've seen again, and I keep on going back to it, but this year has uh, allowed us to exemplify some of the issues in that how fragile the exam system is. Um, you know it had to collapse this year and other forms of assessment were required and while they're probably not perfect in themselves that does show that there are other ways so that might be sort of a, a, a target that aspect of your question the other aspect in terms of um the way you feel like the your child is not um, maybe given the learning experiences you would like them to have due to um, the the teacher trying to be inclusive that, that that's a huge problem and it's something that we absolutely grapple with uh, again I think it's about time it takes time uh, and teachers are skilled they they will take time to get to know all the different learners and at different points they will need to give their energies and attention to different learners but ultimately um the principle that 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 diversity it it really can enhance the learning of all i've been there i've been in the classroom with um some challenging children um and over time you can get to a point where you are really being inclusive and supporting every child's learning but it is complex it's not easy and I don't think it happens quickly uh, furthermore I think teachers again need support with that they need um, they, you know the support of others within schools to help ensure that every child is is getting their learning supported Thank you. Just on as a follow up to that, there's another comment um, just from a teacher, I guess, saying that I feel that it's, it is due to teacher training and experience. I know that for one, I would provide the minority with a task to develop and practice the skills that they are struggling with while I support the majority. And then I use my attention to support the minority. That's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next question from Wendy. Collaborative networks are a great idea, but at the moment teachers are under tremendous pressure trying to teach pupils in schools and those who are isolating at home. And lack of time is a real issue. How do we make the time? Again, another it's another key question and it's one that I think we'll always um, kind of grapple with. And I think it's almost like a chicken and egg situation. What do we start with? And actually, if we were forced to make time to develop these kind of collaborative networks then I think that would have a, a knock and effect in saving time in other places and um, you know so ultimately something that will enable um, us all to work uh, I was going to say more efficiently, but I find that word difficult. I don't like efficiency because I think that's kind of getting to the end point without exploring possibilities, but to help us to work together and help not make life easier but make it smoother and 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 more helpful I suppose is what I'm trying to get to um but how do we do that when do we do that um that's I think these kind of you know ripples of disruption and coming together I know some of the students on the, our courses you know they're forced to make time because it's part of their assignment and actually that that seems a bit um cruel but it's amazing the benefits then that then reaps and then they save time in other places, if that makes sense. 
Thank you. Then a question from Emma. Do you know of any educational systems in Europe that you would consider more inclusive than the Scottish one? Do you know, Scotland is held up fairly highly when it comes to being inclusive. Um, I think, I think, well, Wales have been undergoing some quite interesting reforms, so somewhere to consider. Um, there, it's always very hard to do a direct, direct comparison. Um, and you can get like bits of system at different stages. For example, uh, early year stages in northern Italy would be seen as, you know, the learning is just sort of seamless between uh, the this the settings, earlier settings in the community, and it's you know so inclusive of everybody. Um, but later on, it it's not quite the same. So there's little pockets, I would say. But I think, you know. In the in the scheme of things, Scotland are doing OK. Um, but yeah, we as educators think we always have that question about what we could do better, don't we? Um, it does drive us. And there's a question here around local authorities. What do you think the level of awareness um, or understanding by those in charge of local authority education is of inclusion and what that can look like in the average classroom when the agenda remains a push for attainment? Mm, good question. Good question. Again, I think there will be, of course, there's going to be individuals uh, at local authority level who um, very much value inclusion, inclusive approaches, recognise it, get it. But again, it goes back to these systems and structures, doesn't it? And um, and they're working in, you know, the same the same pressures that that you are in the classroom. So um, again, I think that's why we need to have again the networks, collaboration between kind of actually let's let's deconstruct things a little bit take a step back and what is really important here um i think the other point to make there is that inclusion and attainment aren't necessarily contradictory things there can absolutely be both um there's a wonderful book called inclusion and attainment or inclusion and achievement um it's by uh, Lanny Florian and Martin Rouse and I think Christine Black Hawkins. Um, so I think that can often be a barrier. Some people think it's an either or, um, but we can get to the point we have both. And then there's a comment following on from that. I think there are huge system systemic challenges and pressures at play where staff may really feel on board with inclusion, but their expectation from local authorities to achieve remain high. I am assuming many on here tonight are at the chop place and not those with a certain amount of power to change the systems higher up in the chain. How do we engage them? Um, I may be wrong and I apologise if there are directions <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we and I have um, some of my students are look at local authority level as well. So I think that there, there are there is an appetite, there's interest. It, it's just again, you you've 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 got it nailed on the head. They're under the same pressures we are, um, and when you're having to go in with a very narrow lens and look for literacy, numeracy, you know who's achieving what when, uh, and it's based on these very kind of contested principles. You know, it's all based on this kind of idea that a more a majority will attain around well, you know, a, a middle and a norm, and there'll be a minority at either end. Uh, but that is, that's been so heavily contested and, you know, the, it is a, a social construct. So I think taking time and it's, that's, it goes back to the, the initial question, you know, do we just keep doing what we're doing and never have time? Or do we actually just stop and take time to break down, to deconstruct and, you know, reimagine um what things might be like but i think you know i i realize that's not you know something that's going to happen tomorrow or an overnight but just having these conversations can be a starting point okay um another question i would like to see us adopt blended learning as there are many young people who have benefited from learning in a different physical environment we need more options so that's a comment rather than a question but I don't know if interesting one yeah I, I mean, I, I don't know what stage you're 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 working at. Um, 
certainly from a university perspective, I, I would tend to agree. Um, I, I would agree fully online is is challenging, but blended, um, like you say, there could be possibilities, can be more flexible, can't it? And we were chatting just before this started and some students seem really comfortable online. Um, but I would worry about the social aspects of learning, um, which I know we can get online, but not perhaps to the same extent. Um, but yeah, interesting idea, thanks. <coughs> There's quite a lot of um, comments, well, a couple of comments coming through about how to measure the success of attainment. Um, and really, you know, that is the best way to measure the success of the school. So someone said, um, how else would we do a survey of people's happiness upon leaving school or parental understanding of the school's priorities? What is the alternative? Oh, um, yeah. Interesting ideas. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And hey, answers on the back of a postcard. I mean, <laughs> there's that classic uh, quote. I can't remember where from. That's terrible. You can tell it's nearly the holidays. That you know, if the only thing we, you know, we whatever is valuable is that that can be measured. Uh, and we know that's not the case. We know uh, learning experiences expand well beyond that what we can measure. Uh, it's such a crude tool, um, but like you say, it's easy, it's relatively accessible. You can compare schools, you can compare local authorities, you can identify where the gaps are, um, and you can tell I'm critical of that notion. Um, so that Numbers always speak, don't they? And, and I really battle with this a lot because a lot of the research I do and I enjoy and I engage with is about the qualitative, the experiences, the stories, the lived experiences, the different perspectives. Uh, and you're right, we are we are grappling with very established expectations in terms of what things should look like, how they should be done. Numbers seem to uh, resonate and flow in ways that stories don't. Um, I suppose uh, I'll refer here to someone called Michael Apple, who's a great philosopher um, from the States. And he, it's all about accountability, isn't it, this question? Um, and he reminds us of, of the question, well, who are we accountable to? And he would say that we shouldn't be accountable to the people above and the government, but we should be accountable to the children and the families. And furthermore, that he reminds us that uh, the word account, which is now kind of synonymous with numbers and figures, is to re recall, to tell an account, to tell a story. So I think there are very many more ways we could be accountable and to demonstrate our success, if you like, of our education system, of our schools, of our practices. Sorry, that was a bit of a, ta a tangent. I do like Michael Apple, so. <laughs> Uh, there's another comment here about saying that inclusion is very much at the forefront of local authority thinking. The focus is on attainment and achievement for all. The view is not a split between minorities and majorities, but a focus on finding ways that empower all. Yeah, lovely. Um, and there's a question below. What is the first thing that a teacher could do in a classroom to disrupt the system of exclusion? Ooh. Oh, oh, what would be the first thing? Where's the starting point? Well, I would say start small. I don't want anyone to be fired. Uh, you know, don't say that you listen to a crazy lady uh, from the university and you're going to go in and completely rebel. Um, not on your own anyway, um, but start small. I, I think there's some really subtle things that we can do and it can be things like a change of language, uh, really kind of examining our language and actually the, the amount of exclusions we make by the things we say and whether that's, you know, those subtle expectations, for example. Um, and again, I, this is just a, a story. Uh, it's an anecdote. It's not casting any judgment because I truly believe the systems create these kind of interactions. But, um, you know, observing teachers, students and often uh, an approach used in classrooms is chilly challenges. So the children are given choice and giving choice is a great way of um, 
enhancing inclusion in the classroom, building autonomy in the learners. Um, and you get children that want to choose the really the hardest challenge and then you get the really do you think why don't you try this one and it's 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 these subtle little things that give messages uh, that can stigmatize and marginalize um particular learners and learners are so aware we all know that learners could probably write a list of the class in whatever they think the the order of ability is um, so it's i think especially in, in the context of this current year and the pandemic is how can we broaden what we value what the children can do and what they bring and it might cause us to uh, move away from what we usually do and what we usually recognize and that can be really hard and it can be sometimes you've got to look really hard but there will be things there um you know while children's experiences at home might not have reinforced the type of learning that is valued in schools they will have had experiences at home they'll be doing something it might not be something that we value or think is very helpful but there will be learning and finding that and valuing that and making space for that can can be a starting point there's a nice comment around value we should measure what we value not value what we can measure that's a nice way of summing it up yes you much more eloquently than i did well done <laughs> and there's another comment that they have, like your idea of being accountable to the families and the pupils rather than um, authorities there's a question here someone saying that she's or he or she is a probationer why do local authorities not collaborate with each other to achieve the scottish government aims i've done my dissertation on inclusion and it's a question that i've always wondered i don't know if you would be able to answer I that am, one it's, it's interesting isn't it um it's that kind of i don't know what the i don't know what the answer is so i suppose the the idea of you know, we have a national level and then we've got local authority level and we've got all, um, all the local authorities in Scotland. I should probably know how many there are off the top of my head, uh, especially at the moment. <laughs> we get told it often enough. Um, and so in, in a way that's nice because you get the kind of more lo localised, more nuanced, you know, adapting the policies to really reflect uh, particular local areas. So that can be a real positive thing. And I suppose it's about, well, how do we do that, but also not feel that we need to compete? Um, and I think the notion of competition, even though if it's not explicit, is so driven in to um, our education system. I mean, our, our curriculum in Scotland, if you're joining from Scotland, if you're not, so our curriculum is called the Curriculum for Excellence. That title is competitive. It's making a stance. This is the best we're the best and and that generate again that's use of language isn't it so um so those kind of particular ways of viewing and being really penetrate and i think you're right i think we should have a much more collaborative approach and um, there there's lots of collaborations that do take place um but they can sometimes feel invisible so i think i think that's a great idea um, and a question from Catherine, working in the ASN sector, I value the supports that we are able to provide to educate some very unique individuals. However, I'm aware that in doing so, we are creating separation. How do we bring these children together in a meaningful, respectful and productive way? What a lovely question. Um, and I think you're right, it's about meaningful uh, inclusion because it goes back to that initial question to you know to include in is not necessarily to be inclusive um i think there's different ways and i think it's all contextual and it depends on your knowledge of the child and the children and the setting um and i think you're really you know it's one of those uncomfortable reflections that by you know taking um a child or a group of children out on a regular basis we can we can exclude and marginalize and stigmatize and 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 that can that can feel not good um so it's finding ways i mean one of the our master students whose wonderful project i had the the privilege of cross marking she 
worked in a, a setting with uh, children with quite severe autism and it was connected to a mainstream school and they tried lots of different things uh, and that's it you can just try and see what you know in a well thought through way but see what works for the children in the setting so they tried taking the children uh, with autism into the mainstream school and it didn't work um, it was upsetting it wasn't you know it wasn't purposeful it wasn't meaningful um, and so what they did was they did something called reverse inclusion and they got children from the mainstream school and took them into the the unit where the children with quite severe autism were based and um, my goodness when we talk about other forms of evidence of success here was one these children were asked to the children with autism and I think the children uh, from the the mainstream uh, school were asked to kind of keep a little diary a journal and they could draw write express how they felt about these sessions that took place over a number of weeks. I hope I'm being accurate here. Um, but the drawings were so powerful, especially the drawings of some of the children with autism who started to include the children from the, the school into their drawings and it became such an important part of their learning, their, their learning community. So there are many different ways and I another one of my fantastic students, a PhD student would say, you know, what is inclusive in one setting might be exclusive in another. So it's not clear cut. Um, so that's almost why we need these sort of a principled stance and the inclusive pedagogy I was talking about is a principled framework for exploring how we can be inclusive because one size doesn't fit all. OK, we've got a couple more questions that we might manage to squeeze in. Uh, are there cases, I think you've actually just covered this, but I don't know if there's anything you would add. Are there cases where including in the in mainstream is not the best solution? Yeah, so I think that example example works quite well. Um, and up, you can take a very extreme view of inclusion. Every child, no matter what, should be in um, in a mainstream school and sometimes the school doesn't have the provision you know you, children and young people with highly specialized needs maybe need medical care uh, you know obviously in an ideal world absolutely we could be a uh, one big learning community um, but even even if we're in separate schools I think it's then okay how can we make connections how can we work across and I think that example is a really nice one um, question here from Lynn, just thinking about the situation we are in regarding COVID, I'd be keen here to hear your thoughts on poverty and poor mental health as barriers to education, two things that will likely get worse in the coming months. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think the COVID pandemic has exacerbated the inequalities that exist and, and now that hopefully a vaccine is on the horizon, I am feeling more and more prompted to think right this is we need to stop and reflect. We know that inequalities are often created at a, a systematic level, so I think much needs to be done there. Uh, but obviously, in the meantime, <laughs> in schools, you've got to you've got to do our best. Many of my colleagues, I've got a group of colleagues who are currently exploring how um, how beginning teachers might best include support and meet the learning needs of um, children in from high poverty contexts. I think the key message is always that kind of that dilemma of difference. You know, how do we acknowledge the differences that exist, but meet the needs in a way that doesn't um, exacerbate that difference or lead to stigmatisation? And I think we've got to be really careful about how we how we use labels, I suppose. And I, for me, uh, poverty has become another kind of quite big label. I knew uh, in one of the last schools I worked in, I had to be able to recite the children who were on the, the list of children who were seen as being in poverty. And actually some of those children were some of my more a most able children in the class. So it's quite a crude um, measurement, but at the same time, we need to acknowledge that there are 
there are challenges that arise and that we need to find ways to support their learning that also can benefit everyone. I think that's us at the end. So there's been a few com uh, comments, general comments, saying it was very interesting. We can see how these situations have, ar have arisen. And someone at the end here has just said, I'm preparing for an interview for a regional collaborative post tonight. It has been so great to hear the views and positivity towards collaboration. So it's quite a nice comment. To finish oh, on, I think. nice. <laughs> I'm glad. A bit of serendipity there. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for coming along and staying with me. It felt very odd. I couldn't see anyone when I was presenting. So I, I was basically presenting to um, some socks and ironing that's on the dining room table with my laptop. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you all very much. And thank you to Fiona and Jacinta for your support.